Just going to wait for a few more people to come on, guys, and then we'll get going. Mark's watching, good to see. All right, Tom, hope you're well, pal. Give it a few minutes. Right, I'm going to start. Good morning, everybody. I hope you're all well. Um, it's a pleasure to be connected with you today. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my story. Uh, I hope you find it inspiring, um, possibly motivating and insightful. And I'd love to do some questions at the end. Anything you think of during my talk, please ask me whatever you like. I'm an open book, so please ask me whatever you like, and I'll try and answer them the best way that I can. So let's get started with my story. First of all, my name's Jack Rutter, and my story is all about how I went from being a potential Premier League footballer, so arguably the best league in the world, to then becoming a para-Olympian and captain of both the England and Great Britain cerebral palsy football team. It's been a, a roller coaster ride, to say the very, very least. But I'd like to take you all back to the start of my footballing journey, where I fell in love with the game, where I found my main passion in life. And this all happened when I was four years old on a Saturday afternoon. And I went into my living room and started watching the TV. And I flicked through the channels and I remember nothing came on of any interest until a game of football comes on the telly. And my eyes just light up. I'm like, what is this? This looks absolutely incredible. And Manchester United were playing, the team that I support. They were about four or five goals up at the time. I thought they seemed like a safe bet. And they were, of course, for a very, very long time until recent times when we dropped down the pecking order quite considerably. But there was one player playing that day who truly inspired me to want to take up the game of football. And his name was Eric Cantona. Now, you young guys on this call or this Facebook live may not know who he is. Some of the older ones, the coaches, will probably remember. What a top player. Eric Cantona played for Leeds United, Manchester United, and he also played for France. But always remember two things about Eric Cantona. When he scored an unbelievable goal, Instead of celebrating wildly and doing knee slides and high fives with his teammates, he'd literally just stand there like some sort of god, just lapping up the applause from the crowd. And he always used to do something very, very unique. He used to play wearing his collar up. So he stood out. He was a maverick. He was a real talisman of the Manchester United team. And I was inspired from that moment to want to be a professional footballer. I wanted to be the next Eric Cantona. I wanted to play for Manchester United. So when this all happened, it was all around about Christmas time. And I said to my mum, I want for Christmas, all that I care about this year is getting a football. And I remember when Christmas day came, I'd never been so excited. I'd never been so happy when I opened up that football for my fourth Christmas present. And I didn't put that football down for a spare second of the day. Just practicing my skills, trying to be the best footballer that I could possibly be. And I was rewarded for all of that hard work when I was 10 years old and I managed to sign for Birmingham City Football Club, who at the time were in the Premier League, the best league in England, arguably one of the best leagues in the world. And I spent eight years at the Birmingham City Football Academy, all the way from 10 years old, all the way through the ranks to 18 years old, playing against all the big teams, Manchester United, Manchester City, Liverpool, Arsenal. I travelled to Italy, France, Ireland to play for my country, travelled all over the UK. It was an incredible time. I was also lucky enough to play with and against footballers who have gone on to play in the Premier League, 
gone on to play internationally and gone on to play in the Champions League. It was an unbelievable experience. Signed a scholarship when I was 16, so I moved up to Birmingham and I lived there full time and I played football day in, day out. Got paid to do it. It was a dream come true. Now, at 18 years old, I was doing really, really well. I was played at right back in right, right side of defence. I'd made many appearances for the reserve team, which was only the second team to the team playing in the Premier League. I'd also captain the youth team on many occasions. And we were just about to play in the FA Youth Cup semi-final, one of the biggest youth competitions in the world against Liverpool at Anfield. And I was just about to sign my professional contract. That dream that I had when I saw Eric Cantona on the TV at four years of age and I said to my mum and dad, I want to be a professional footballer. I was just about to achieve my biggest dream in life. However, unfortunately, this all changed. March of 2009. So you're talking just over 11 years ago now. We just beat Watford in the quarterfinal of the FA Youth Cup on the Tuesday night. And at the weekend, we had the weekend off to go back and see friends and family. And I went on a night out on the Saturday night, had a really good evening, catching up with friends, having a really good time. Now, unfortunately, there was a boy in that nightclub who was a little bit jealous and a little bit drunk because he'd seen me kiss a girl that he was absolutely obsessed with. So at the end of the night, when I'm talking to my friend outside of the nightclub, he walked up behind me and he took the opportunity as I'm facing the other way to punch me in the back of the head. Now that one single blow knocked me completely unconscious. So when I fell, I hit the back of my skull on a curb and I was knocked completely unconscious. Okay, and I was rushed to hospital, rushed to French A Hospital, which is a special brain injury hospital. The injuries that I suffered were very, very severe. For the first 48 hours or so, it was touch and go whether I'd even survive or not. I was very, very lucky, but I still sustained very, very serious injuries. I fractured my skull, the back of my skull, and on the sides just here, and I also severed my cochlear nerve, which means I'm completely deaf in my right ear, will be for the rest of my life. And I also suffered brain damage. And when I left hospital, roughly three weeks after the assault, I left in a wheelchair because at the time, my balance and my coordination was so, so bad. When it first happened, I couldn't even walk straight. I was all unbalanced. I was very, very tired. It was a very, very traumatic experience. And these injuries led to me having to retire from professional football when I was only 19 years old because I had such bad problems with my coordination, my balance, my fatigue. So I was tired all the time. But also I had problems mentally as well. So I had problems with my memory, my concentration and my emotional control. So I'd get very angry and then one minute I'll be very sad and then one minute I'll be very, exci very excited. It was a crazy, crazy time in my life. But obviously retiring from professional football, 19 years old, before it all began, it was a really, really challenging time, really, really tough time for me and my family. And that's when I did suffer a lot with my mental health. So I was very, very sad and depressed. You know, I'd lost my biggest dream in life. I was very anxious about my future. So I was unsure what a future without football would look like. How was I going to buy a house, you know, buy a car, provide for a family, have a career? All of these things were worrying me. And I was also very, very angry. So it was a very, very tough time for everybody involved and who were close to me. And I was going down a really, really bad path, you know, failed at many things, wasn't going very well, really, really struggling. But in 2012, I got a lifeline out of nowhere. I got a second chance to get back into the thing I loved doing the most. And that was with the seven aside para Olympic football team, which is basically football available for anybody who has suffered a brain injury. 
either at birth, so things like cerebral palsy, or later on in life, maybe people injured in wars, uh, injured in a car crash, myself with an assault, or people who suffer from strokes as well. And fortunately, I took up the opportunity with both hands and became captain of not only England, but also the great Britain team. It led to five incredible years, five years of playing for my country. My first tournament was in Barcelona in the Intercontinental Championships. I always remember seeing my shirt hung up for the first time. Rutter, nine on the back. I'm welling up, I'm emotional. I can't believe that this has happened. And I managed to score quite a few goals in that competition. I played really well. I was lucky enough to be named in the team of the tournament in my first competition playing for my country. And I was rewarded with the captaincy following that competition. Couldn't believe it. A year prior to that, I'd stopped watching football, stopped playing football completely. Didn't want anything to do with it. So to be named captain of my country, having gone through all of that trauma, was a dream come true. I then went on to captain the England Paralympic team in one European Championships, which took place in Portugal, which was unbelievable experience playing in Portugal, in Porto. Some great games along the way, drew against the number one team in the world, Ukraine, scored a free kick against them. Unbelievable memories there. And I also captained the England team in two World Championships. One in England on home soil for us, which was the largest disability football competition ever held in the UK. And the second was in Argentina in 2017, where we reached the semi-final of the World Cup for the first time in our history. We made history, so very fond memories to look back on there as well. But the icing on the cake definitely came from my story when I was named captain of the Great Britain team that went to the second biggest sporting event in the world, the Paralympic Games, which took place in Brazil in 2016. That's when finally my dreams became a reality. Two of the games playing in front of 15,000 people, live on the telly, millions watching around the world. What an incredible experience. I managed to captain the team to a fifth place finish which is the highest finish for a GB team at a Paralympic Games in over 30 years. So it's very, very, very thankful for that opportunity. It was incredible to play in front of my friends and my family live on the world stage. What an amazing opportunity. What an amazing experience. Now, unfortunately, uh, following our amazing achievement of finishing in fourth place, in the World Cup in 2017 in Argentina, I now cannot play for the England and Great Britain team. Basically, I've recovered well to play. It may seem mad, but I'm not eligible to play in Paralympic football anymore, which was you know, a bit of a compliment because I've recovered so well. I've gone from not being able to walk straight to being able to you know, run well and move my body how I used to. And I've recovered very, very well. So I take it as a compliment, but of course it was a bit of a frustration. But following retirement, I'm now up to so many different things. I now have my own company, Jack Rutter Skills School, where I work in schools and colleges, universities, in businesses up and down the country. I've just passed my UEFA A coaching license, which is um, the highest coaching qualification you can get. You've got the pro license after that, which is more management and leadership. But in terms of coaching, I've got the highest coaching qualification with my A license. I work at the Gloucestershire University Football, and I also coach the England under-21 Paralympic team. I'm also a motivational speaker, so a bit like what I'm doing today on Facebook Live for the first time ever as well. So uh, this is a bit of a new experience for me. But I do speeches up and down the country, which are thoroughly enjoyable. And I'm also an athlete mentor. So I work for a double gold Olympic champion in Dame Kelly Holmes. Uh, she won two golds in Athens. I now work for a charity running personal and social development programs up and down the country. And I'm also an ambassador for various charities and organisations. Probably the best one has to be working for McDonald's Fun Football. Um, that is a, an amazing organisation, one of the biggest in the world. And I get to work with people like Ryan Giggs, Sir Jeff Hurst, 
Casey Stoney, absolutely incredible. And my biggest goal now moving forward is to continue doing the work that I'm doing, but I'd like to become manager of the England CP team, the Paralympic team in the future. That's what I'm working towards at the moment. If I can do that, that'll be absolutely incredible. And I firmly believe that I'm in the position that I am today because of these three steps. And these are the messages that I'd like to get across to all of the players listening to this Facebook Live session today. Steps to success are this. Number one, you have to be resilient in life. It goes without saying. Life's full of ups and downs. We all go through challenges in life. We all go through ups and downs. And it's my opinion is that it's those people who can overcome those challenges, who can pass those tests, who deal with those ups and downs the best, that normally achieve the most in life. We all go through bad experiences, but what a lot of people do, and it's easy to do this, they let a bad experience define them for the rest of their life. And they use it as an excuse. They say, I could have done that. I could have been a professional footballer, but this happened. I could have you know, owned a business, but this happened. Okay, They use it as an excuse. They're defined by a bad experience. What I challenge you to do as players is this. Try and use any bad experiences that you go through as motivation to galvanise you forward to try and be as successful as you possibly can be today and in the future. That, for me, is what a resilient person is all about. Second point is this. You have to be willing to step out of your comfort zone. It's very easy to live in that bubble, that circle of comfort, but you'll never, ever reach your true potential in your comfort zone. What I challenge you to do is this. Can you step out of your comfort zone? Can you do things that stretch you, that scare you, that make you a little bit anxious? Okay, I always refer to the 60% rule, and I got this from a Navy SEAL called David Goggins. He says that the average person only reaches 40% of their true potential. I urge you not to be in that 40%. Try and reach as big a potential as you possibly can do. And the only way you can do that is by stepping out of your comfort zone and trying to do things that scare you, that make you a little bit stretched. That's the only way you'll truly know what you're capable of achieving. I remember one of the first speeches I did was at a school in 2014, I think. There's only about 30 children in the school and my speech was absolutely awful. I was red in the face. I was reading from a piece of paper, shaking like a leaf. It was terrible. And I got in the car and I was like, you know, maybe this isn't for me. Um, maybe I don't want to do this anymore. And I remember I drove home all upset, all frustrated, you know, really in a bit of a huff and a puff. I remember when I got home, I had a message on Twitter from a boy in the primary school. And he said, Jack, I really found your talk inspiring. It's really, really lifted me and made me want to achieve my goals. And that made me feel absolutely unbelievable. Maybe I can have an impact on people's lives. So from then I said to myself, I may not be very good now or then, sorry, but I can always get better. And the only way you can do that is by stepping out of your comfort zone. That's why I continue to do as much as I possibly can do. And finally, the importance of a positive attitude. So the Paralympic Games uh, showed me how important it is to have a positive attitude. In the Paralympic Games, you have athletes who might be blind. So they're blind, they cannot see, but they do the 100 metre dash quicker than probably anybody on this call. You have people who are blind who play football and they cannot see to an unbelievable level. You have athletes in wheelchairs, possibly missing limbs, and they still compete at such a top level, and they're good people, and that's because of their mindset, okay, they're so strong in the mind, they have such a positive attitude, they don't focus on the things that they maybe cannot do, they purely focus on the things they can do, and it's an unbelievably inspiring competition, and I always remember seeing this athlete in the Paralympic Games, which completely changed, he completely changed my views towards life, in the Olympics, you live in an athlete village and you live there for three weeks. There's all sorts of stuff in the athlete village. There's a cinema, a swimming pool, there's an arcade, 
There's a McDonald's as well that's free for any athlete, any hour of the day. So we tucked into a few chicken nuggets when our last game was done. That was absolutely amazing. But we also have a huge food hall. And this is where I met this Chinese athlete. He's a Chinese swimmer. Okay, and to put it into context, he's got no arms. So he's got no arms, completely severed here and here. But he swims and he's as quick as lightning. He's the, I think he's a world champion. I think he's the Paralympic champion. But one day... I see him in the food hall, okay? And he's by himself and he had his food in front of him. He had some chicken and he had some rice in a bowl. And I remember thinking to myself, well, how's he going to eat his food? He's got no arms. He's got no hands. You know, what's he going to do? So I stood there and I watched him rather rudely. I pretended to be on my phone. I stood behind him and I watched him. So I wanted to see what he would do. He then proceeded to put his legs on the table, okay, he had a fork in between one foot and he had a knife in between the other foot. He then used his feet as hands to cut up his chicken and eat his chicken and his rice. And I just stood there in amazement and I said to myself, wow, if he can do that, what can I do? If he can do that, what can every single person do in life if they have a positive attitude towards life. And that's why I absolutely love this quote. And this quote really sums up the Paralympics and hopefully sums up my story. The only disability in life is a bad attitude. So why not have a positive one and see how far it can take you? That concludes my talk, everyone. Um, but I'd love to do some Q&A. So I'm just looking at some comments here. Please take this opportunity to ask me whatever question you want. And I'll try and get back to you as much as I can. Feel free to ask me whatever you want, guys. Okay, let's have a look at the comments here. Okay, some really nice comments here from Neil Hilton saying, Jack, very inspiring story, and I applaud you for your strength. Always interesting me as a special education teacher myself. I have many students who can compete at Special Olympics events that are unable, unbelievable occasions. How would you describe the Paralympics as an event and how, was, how you was treated as an athlete? So I touched on it a bit in my story there. Um, Neil, thank you for the question, Neil. Uh, it was absolutely incredible. We get treated like royalty. It's the first time I ever felt like a rock star in my life with all the cameras in your face and the, and the stadiums. I mean, in two of the games, there's 15,000 people in there. Um, the media attention is huge. So really, really get treated very well. And the Special Olympics is also an unbelievable um, an unbelievable event. I'm lucky enough to be an ambassador for um, the English Special Olympics. And I remember going to an event in Sheffield in England and there was thousands of people there. And I know in America, it's even bigger. And having a, a brother who's autistic, I know how important it is for people with learning difficulties to still have the same opportunities as everybody else. So yeah, the Paralympics is incredible and so are the Special Olympics. I'm so thankful there, there are these events available for everybody to get involved in. Thank you for that. Neil, another one coming in here. Bethany McGrady. My son aspires to, to be US 7 aside team. He thinks your story is really cool and inspiring. Thank you, Bethany. Absolutely incredible to hear that. Wish your son all the best from me, please. Um, if he wants to put any questions to me as well, then that would be great. And I can get back to him either on this live call or another time. But I wish him all the best. Another one here from Krista. Who was the biggest influence on your football career? Parents, coaches. Oh, good question. I would say my coaches. Um, I had a coach called Richard Stevens at Birmingham City Football Club. He was he was absolutely incredible. A top top coach. He showed me from a young age what it took to be a, to be a, to be an athlete, to be a, to be a good person, but to also be a top footballer. So Richard Stevens. He's produced loads of footballers um, at Birmingham, at Coventry. And now I think he's at West Bromwich Albion now. Top, top guy, top, top coach. So I would say he was my earliest inspiration in terms of getting into the game um, and playing at a top level, apart from obviously Eric Cantona and then Ryan Giggs and Beckham and players like that. Watching them on the TV was absolutely amazing, being a massive Man United fan. Thank you for that, Krista. OK, David, fantastic story. You mentioned Goggins. Yep, yeah, I did. 
uh, whose Instagram videos are just incredible. Yeah, they are incredible. He's a very, very funny bloke. He's absolutely nuts, but in a good way. Uh, who else, like Goggins, do you enjoy listening to, watching? Oh, good question. Um, let's have a think about that. Really, really good question. Um, I like I like all sorts. I like stuff like a book called The Code of the Extraordinary Mind, which um, is a book that I read um, before the David Goggins one. Definitely urge anybody to read that as well. Talking about finding balance to your life. I mean, he talked about not attaching your happiness to your goals, which I thought was really, really important because in life we can be so goal orientated um, that we're only happy when we achieve that goal. So if we don't achieve it, that shouldn't make us unhappy. Hopefully we just learn from that that um, that experience and are better for it. But if we're happy in the now and happy in the moment, your goals will be easier to achieve. So that book, Code of the Extraordinary Mind, was unbelievable. Don't attach your happiness to your goal goals. That was one of the best things I've read. Um, very, very inspirational. Definitely urge all of you guys um, to read it. And then obviously things on Netflix as well. I can't think off the top of my head now, but just documentaries that are inspiring, athlete journeys, um, are so so important as well, and none more so than that book with with David Goggins. What a fantastic guy! What an unbelievable bloke! So yeah, I tap into those resources as much as possible to improve my mindset. Thank you for that question. Let's have a look here. Oh, it's from Mark, my old pal Mark. Hope you're well, pal. Let's have a look. I just turned that round by accident. Oh, hang on. Sorry about that. Turned you round there. Sorry, guys. <laughs> my mistake. From Mark then. Great story, even hearing so much, so inspiring. Explain your emotions when you got the call from the FA about joining the CP team. It was unbelievable. I think I touched on it in the FA TV video that you might have already watched. Um, you know, I, I wasn't really in a good place. Um, I failed at many things. I remember I took a position and I didn't, that didn't go to plan. I failed a university degree. So things weren't going too well for me at that point. But I got involved in, in CP football. Um, in March of 2012 I didn't make the, the, the Olympic squad or Paralympic squad that year so I was a bit like frustrated by it all but I remember sitting in my room in September of that year and getting a phone call from a guy called Jeff Davis who runs the Paralympic soccer in England and he said Jack we know about your story we know you're a fantastic player and we want you to get involved and I remember just my eyes just welling up I was very very emotional my hand was shaking on the phone I couldn't believe it and I knew that it was an opportunity that I must, took, must take, a second opportunity. And fortunately, I took the opportunity with both hands. And it's led to, you know, incredible things. I mentioned all the things I'm up to now. None of that would have been possible had I not got involved with the Paralympic team. So I have a lot um, to thank Jeff and the sport for. So, yeah, very emotional, but absolutely unbelievable. Thank you, Mark. Any other questions at all coming in at all from anybody? Um, be great to get some more questions while I'm live here. For a few more minutes. And there's another question here from Krista. How old were you when you got when you decided top level football was your goal? Oh, good question. Thank you for that. So um obviously I got involved very, very young, four years old when I watched Eric Cantona on the telly. Um, but you know, you want to be a professional footballer, but it's sort of you know, it's a dream at that point. That's nothing more, nothing less, really, um, like we all have. We all have dreams. All of you players will have watched a player on the TV and been inspired and coaches as well. Um, but I would say it was probably, I would say at about 14, I was at Birmingham City. Um, and I was very, very well. I was captain of the, the under-14 team. Um, it was, was looking good for me to sign a scholarship. And I was playing really, really well week in, week out against top teams. You know, not just you know, your lower end teams. I was playing well against your Manchester United, your Aston Villas, top, top teams in England. It was at that point where I thought, actually, this could be a reality. I might be able to do this. Um, so definitely 14 years of age is when I thought, yeah, I may be able to make a career in the game. Thank you for that question. That was brilliant. One coming here from Tom. You're well, Tom. Uh, thanks for coming on, Jack. You are brave and bold and definitely part of the Titans family. I appreciate you. Any advice to any coaches watching? Thank you, Tom. Very, very humbling to receive, especially from someone like yourself, who's at the top of their game in coaching. Um, I would say the best bit of advice for coaches, I've just completed my A licence, which is unbelievable. But one thing I've learned is that you have to put the person before the player. So, you know, you can't expect 
um, everybody to respond to you the same way. But if you can learn to understand your players' personalities, what motivates them, then you can obviously help connect with them, build a trust with them, and then hopefully you can improve them as a player. So I try and put any players I work with first, once I'm once I get onto a personal sort of level with them, then I can put on sessions to help them to develop on the pitch and off the pitch. But more importantly, it's how those players act and behave. Once you get that right, then the football right, you're on to a winner for me. So person before player is one of my slogans that I like to use now. So that's probably the best bit of advice that I can, I can give to a coach, definitely. Thank you for that question though, Tom. Really good. Another one coming here. My daughter... Wants to know how much did you practice to get great? <laughs> I don't know if I'm great or ever I've been great, but thank you. I practiced every single day. Um, I mean, I'd wake up before school and I'd practice and I'd kick that football around in the garden for hours on end. I remember I'd watch um, a game on the TV, a free kick by Beckham or a skill by Giggs playing for Manchester United and I'll go in the garden for hours practicing it. I just love the game. I had such a passion for it. So I put in so much effort. Um, for Birmingham, we used to train, you know, every single day apart from a Wednesday and a Sunday, whether that was gym sessions, sprint sessions, football sessions. So it's just full on. And even with England, it was the same. We'd be training five days a week, covering stuff to improve our technical ability. We'd watch games to improve our tactical ability. We'd have a phys physical conditioning programme as well. And we'd also meet up as players and staff so that we could improve socially as well. They're the four corners of the game. If you can try and improve those four corners week in and week out, you've got a great chance of being a, of being a, a, a top player and reaching your potential as a player, which is the most important thing. Great question. That was a really fantastic one. Stuart, here we go. Jack, for your young players... For our young players watching, you mentioned the ups and downs of the journey. How important would you say, hang on, let me just get the rest of it. The experience of adversity, in addition to success, is to becoming finished product. It's massively important. I think you have to go through bad times in life to realise what you're truly capable of. I think before my brain injury, I was maybe a bit narrow-minded, a bit selfish. I didn't have a lot of time for others, but... My brain injury and what happened to me humbled me. It really did. It made me appreciate my friends, my family. And obviously, it makes me appreciate how much I love being physically active and playing football. So it definitely changed me for the better. Um, I'm actually, in a, mad, in a mad crazy way, I'm actually glad it happened because it showed me what I was capable of achieving. And now I'm a better person. And I now have a career for the rest of my life. So I'm very, very fortunate. And that's the main thing I've probably, I've probably learned from it and to be in the position that I am today. You know, life's full of ups and downs, full of tests. The more of those ups and downs you can deal with, the more challenges you can pass, the more you can achieve on and off the field. You have to be resilient. You have to have desire and courage to do that in any industry. No worries, Stuart. OK, there's no more questions, guys, coming in. We might finish there if that's all right with you. It's been absolutely incredible to share my story with you. I hope you've enjoyed it um, and I wish you all the best. Stay safe. OK, stay at home, follow the government guidelines, get your practice in and hopefully I'll get to come out and uh, see you guys in the near future. Maybe take a few football sessions or something with the Titans and the Stings. All the best, guys. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much.